All right, 2 Corinthians chapter 2. It's a brief chapter with 17 verses here. Yep, and uh, a couple of um, brief points, but a couple of very important points in this chapter. Remember the background is Paul had sent him uh, 1 Corinthians of two or three years before and was really uh, scathing, <laughs> and they needed it. And he's told them he's going to come and see him, but he's getting, been getting put off and had to go other places. And some, some of them start to think he didn't really mean it. Last chapter he says, I meant it. You know, my yay's yay, my nay's nay, but I just hadn't got there yet. <laughs> but he's coming. So chapter 2, verse 1, he says, But I determined this with myself, that I would not come again with you in heaviness. I, I want to come when, when the things are right. For if I make you sorry, this is kind of a, a circular thing you can, you can think of, but it makes sense. Is if I make you sorry, who is it that makes me glad? But the same which is made sorry by me. He says, if I'm going to come and see you at your church, said I want to be, I want to be rejoicing over you because you'll be what'll well, be making me happy. But but if I come and uh, it's it's sad, then I'll be sad too. But I want it to be a good thing. And I wrote this same unto you. Lest when I came, I should have sorrow from them whom I ought to rejoice. Now, when we read 1 Corinthians, they wasn't much to rejoice over. He was mad. They was really messed up. But Paul's given them time. Now, he's hoping that he can come and it'll be a, a glad thing and he won't have to be scolding on them. I wrote to you, lest when I came, I should have sorrow from them whom I ought to rejoice. I ought to be rejoicing over my church. Having confidence in you all that... My joy is the joy of you all, or you are my joy. The church ought to be his joy. For out of much affliction and anguish of heart, I wrote unto you with many tears. Now, I think he's referencing back to 1 Corinthians. He says it was hard to write that letter. It was hard to be so rough on you all, but you needed it. You know, Out of much affliction and anguish of heart, I wrote unto you with many tears. Not that you should be grieved. His purpose wasn't just to cause them grief but that you might know the love which I have more abundantly unto you. And that's something to think about right there. You know, just because the, the, the preacher is straight with you don't mean he, he don't like you. It, it's kind of like a, well, look at your kids, you know. Like if your kids could have anything they want, they'd want candy for breakfast and candy for supper and candy for lunch, Right. And, you know, you really love your kids. You want to make them happy, so just feed them that sugar all the time, right? And they'd love you for it, right? But it wouldn't be healthy for them, would it? And, and, the, and the pastor's job is to, Jesus said, to feed my sheep, right? And if you just feed the sheep sugar all the time, they're not going to be healthy. Well, and once in a while, they've got to have some roughage, right? And, and Paul had to give them a bunch of roughage in 1 Corinthians, but... Uh, it was for a purpose. It was not because he didn't love them, but because he did love them and wanted them to do right. It may have taken them a little while to figure that out, just like your kids would think, you don't really love me if you're not giving me my candy for lunch, right? <laughs> Hopefully they'll grow up and understand that. But if any have caused grief, he's not grieved me, but in part, a little bit, that I may not overcharge you all. Now, the next verse or two is sort of a guesswork what he's referring to, but if you're familiar with 1 Corinthians, there was a man there who, whatever is meant by this, had shacked up with his stepmother, is what I think is happening here. Remember that? And Paul says, that ain't even heard of among the pagans. And remember what Paul said to do for, I think it's 1 Corinthians 5. He said, uh, he said you, you can't have any fellowship with him. You got to, basically they had to excommunicate him and put him out of the church and not have any fellowship with him. Well, now it's been a couple of years or so, and Paul and, and I'm, I'm taking it that the circumstances have changed or he wouldn't tell them this, but verse 6, he says, Sufficient to such a man is this punishment, which was inflicted of many. He asked the whole church to turn, turn their back on him. Shun him, so that, but his, his punishment is sufficient now. It's enough 
so that contrary wise you ought rather to forgive him and comfort him. See what I mean? If that's what he's referring to, then Paul wouldn't say to forgive him and comfort him unless the situation had changed. But if the situation has changed, then that's, that's the point of punishment. That's the point of chastisement from God himself is, is not just to be punishment to his children in this world, but it's correction. It's, it's about restoration, bringing them back in the right relationship. So that contrary wise, you ought rather to forgive him and comfort him and you can let him back now if, if he's repented and shown it in his life, lest perhaps such a one should be swallowed up with over much sorrow. Wherefore I beseech you that you would confirm your love toward let him know you love him. For to this end also did I write that I might know the proof of you whether you be obedient in all things. I wrote and I asked questions. I've had people been coming back from Corinth. I guarantee you anybody been around Corinth, Paul wanted to know how they was doing. If any Christian he run into, if Paul was in Ephesus or something, right, uh, and they've come from Corinth, he wants to know what's the church going. Uh, what are they doing about this? Are they getting right over there? I sent them a letter. I want to know that there's obedient in all things. And to whom you forgive, verse 10, to whom you forgive anything, I forgive also. I trust you, church. For I forgave, if I forgave anything to whom I forgave it, for your sakes forgave I it in the person of Christ. Importance, an important thing for Christians is forgiveness. You've got to learn to forgive people. No matter what they've done to you, you don't have to go back into the same relationship with before. If you get in the car with a buddy and found out too late that they were drinking and they wrecked and they hurt you, you can forgive that person. But that don't mean you got to get back in a car with them again someday, right? But you can still forgive. And as long as you don't forgive them, they still have some kind of power over you. There's freedom in, in, in forgiveness. But forgiveness, that old saying about for, forgive and forget, that ain't necessarily true. You can forgive, but you can learn from a bad experience too. Because if you don't forgive, verse 11 says exactly what happened to you. Lest Satan should get an advantage over us. You can't go run around with unforgiveness in your heart without giving the devil a toehold in your life. For we're not ignorant of his devices. Furthermore, when I came to Troas to preach Christ's gospel, a door was opened unto me of the Lord. Might be an explanation why to some of them upset that Paul ain't made it back yet. He says, well, when I came to Troas and I began to preach, he may have been on his way, he says, but the Lord opened up a door and I couldn't leave right, right yet. People was getting saved. And I had no rest in my spirit because when he was there, he said, I couldn't find Titus, my brother, my Christian brother. But taking leave of them, I went from thence into Macedonia. I had to go look and see what happened to Titus. He might have been in trouble. But now thanks be unto God, which always causes us to triumph in Christ, and maketh manifest the savor of his knowledge by us in every place. For wherever he and the brothers go, there's Christianity coming there. And it's revealed to the people that live there that, hey, there's Christians among us. And he follows that thought with this. It's a continuation of that thought. For we are unto God a sweet savor of Christ. Now, this is a reference back to the tabernacle imagery when They'd have to offer the sacrifices, and it says when they'd offer these sacrifices, it was a sweet-smelling savor going up to the Lord. It was, a, it was a type of Christ, for one thing, but Paul takes it and says, uh, for we're, we Christians, we're, we're a sweet savor of Christ. In them that are saved and in them that are perished. A sweet savor of Christ. I had this thought today. Them that are saved and them that are anti-Christian even. We're still a savor of Christ. If you look at it from the latter, it could be like somebody that's uh, against God and against the church and against Christians and he's around you or something that says, I smell a Christian. A savor unto Christ, right? But for the other people in the world, is you're a witness of Christ, either way you're a witness of Christ, either whether they're against you or whether they're for you, but to the other people in the world, that's another way to look at it. Do you smell like a Christian? 
to the world? Are you a saver of Christ to the people that we're among? To the one, verse 16, we're the saver of death. Just practice your Christianity in front of everybody the same, right? I was talking to the, the plumber in here today. He's talking about, he goes to church somewhere, but he's like, uh, I forgot the term he used for it, but he's like, we're real big about you should be a Christian. Not the same outside the church as you are inside the church. And I'm like, well, yeah, me too. That's what Christianity is. It's not like we come to church and get inside the walls and play one thing and be somebody else out there, that's called being a hypocrite. We come to church to worship, but our Christianity should be 24-7. We're always a Christian. To the one, we're a savor of death, but to the other, there's always those for and against us, right? To the other, a savor of life unto life, and who's sufficient for these things? For we're not as many which corrupt the word of God. Now think about that implied in there or just really straight out and you dig into it Paul this is first century stuff the church is on the cutting edge of the mission field and, and it's spreading like wildfire but Paul says to this Corinthian church even right here this long ago that there's already a lot of people out there, there that are corrupting the word of God Paul does the same thing Jesus does he always takes us back and points at the scriptures that's where our authority is at he said, we're not like those folks, or we're not like many which corrupt the word of God. But as of sincerity, and corrupting the word of God, not everybody's always going to agree on every secondary doctrine. That's not what it's talking about. But there are people that want to try to further their own agenda by twisting and bending the word of God to support it wrongfully. That's corrupting the word of God. But be sincere. But as of sincerity. Well, he's used that word more than once. It's, it's something about in sincerity. But as of God. And here's the thing that will keep you sincere in your faith. And trying to not corrupt the word of God. Is if you just remember. That God's watching us. In the sight of God. Speak we in Christ. Let's pray together. Lord, we don't pretend to have a corner on the market and get everything exactly right from the scriptures, but Lord, we try, we sincerely try, and we want to honor God through his word and help us to remember that you're the one we answer to and that you're the one that we're standing in the side of as we speak on behalf of Jesus in whose name we gather here. Amen.